Hello, my name is Pierre Lambiazzi, and it's a pleasure to be here with Elaine Chu, who is a mathematician, musician, and operations researcher. Elaine's particularly interested in the structure of music, and I have a specific interest in physiological responses of patients. And having met um, Elaine, it's very clear that musicians use specific techniques to change the response of individuals to music. And this is something I'd like to ask Elaine about in more detail, really, is, mm -hmm. is it true that musicians actually do manipulate the music to evoke particular responses in the listeners? So this is, uh, for example, when one's listening to a piece of music, one might get a shiver down their spine, mm -hmm. as it were, when you're listening to a piece of music or watching particularly right. emotional film where the musical background is influencing how you mm -hmm. feel. Yeah. It's easier for me to just give some examples of the kinds of things musicians do. Yeah. So I have uh, pre-recorded some uh, clips and I'm going to play them now. Excellent. Okay, okay. let's have a look. <laughs> music moves us. It can convey complex states of being to provoke different reactions from the listener. From joyful naivete to strident confidence. Performers shape musical sound properties to design different listening experiences. Including playing with expectations to create tension, like here. Let's make this more extreme. I can take time here because I know that you, the listener, will wait for the resolution, a harmonic resolution. And as the expectation rises, so does the tension. And this is the expected resolution. Which is repeated and reinforced again and again. It is especially comforting when the sequence leads inevitably to the same note again. But this comfortable feeling does not last as we reach this more tense, more dissonant chord. We're building tools to capture and decipher such mechanisms of musical expressivity. My research team and I have been building this citizen science platform called Cosmonote for studying expressive performance. Here you see tempo and loudness. This is piano music, so we can also see the sustain pedal use. And here we have the harmonic tension. These features are important because they are what we sense and respond to in music, consciously or unconsciously. The features allow us to see things such as phrases, which typically follows the tempo envelope or the loudness envelope, in this case both. Over the past uh, few years, Peter and Taggart and I have been looking particularly at the physiological responses of patients um, 
to specific stimuli and we were able to demonstrate that with changes in mental stress this um, resulted in shortening of action potential duration and steeper restitution slopes which are an effective increase in pathetic tone and I can show you a couple of examples of this data in a moment. Action potential durations cannot be recorded directly within the heart unless you have a MAP catheter. However, we can record unipolar electrograms. And the unipolar electrogram allows us to measure the upstroke, time into the upstroke of the T wave from the DVDT max of the essentially the QRS complex of the unipolar electrogram. And from doing this, we can measure the activation recovery interval, which corresponds to the action potential duration. So when studying patients in the cath lab, we can pass a decapolar catheter into the left ventricle, also into the right ventricle, and record unipolar signals at this site and get a measure of both right ventricular and left ventricular electrophysiology. And of course, if one has a catheter in the coronary sinus, in a coronary sinus LV branch, we can also record epicardly. And in this setup here, we undertook studies um, Malcolm, as part of Malcolm Finley's PhD to both record endocardially within the left ventricle and epicardially in the left ventricle, and also um, in the right ventricular septum. Then we subjected patients um, to mental stress using during the course of steady state pacing. And during this period of mental stress, when we asked them to do mental arithmetic, um, serial sevens and so on under pressure, we were able to then look at changes in the act activation recovery interval. We plot these restitution curves here, which is a, a plot of the diastolic interval against the activation recovery interval. And you can see here in gray, there is a displacement of the restitution curve downwards during the time of mental stress, where the action potential shortens. And therefore, this is a marker of the effect of sympathetic tone and intracardiac electrophysiology. We can see here also there was increased dispersion of repolarization during mental stress. And we know that increased dispersion of repolarization is associated with an increased risk of ventricular arrhythmia. Indeed, during the course of one experiment, when a patient was asked to recall an argument with their boss, there was an onset of ventricular tachycardia during this anger recall episode, um, as shown very elegantly here. So essentially, we can demonstrate that mental stress increases sympathetic tone, changes intracardiac electrophysiology, and also is arrhythmogenic. This is taken further in a study um, led by Peter Taggart and undertaken with Jazz Gill at St. Thomas's Hospital, where they played movie clips to patients in the EP lab, recording at the same time the intracardiac electrograms. And one particular moment in the film where the young lady is about to drop um, with very uh, emotional music at the same time. Um, this attracted a lot of me media attention, this research. We can see that there's an increase in the galvanic skin response, which is a mark of increased sympathetic tone, eye sweating. Also, the respiratory rate was also increased. But still, by even controlling respiratory rate, there were changes in um, ARI in response to particular tense moments of the film. And this um, is illustrated here, that the activation recovery interval shortened independent of um, respiration and, and heart rate during these tense moments. So this is really just a very elegant demonstration that by controlling heart rate and respiration, one can measure physiological responses in electrophysiology in response to increased mental stress and also visual um, stimuli um, during um, film clips. So it was because of the fact that we'd already been investigating these physiological changes that made me wonder whether we could actually conduct some studies of patients actually listening to music but still get some precise electrophysiological um, recordings. And it's very clear that when we implant biventricular pacemakers we have left ventricular lead sitting on the epicardium in a branch of the coronary sinus and this allows us again to record unipolar signals. And as part of this work, Elaine designed some musical pieces and... I designed a program to play to these pacemaker patients. The program was selected to have many different large changes within the pieces. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to see contrasting bits of music and what kinds of responses they evoke mm -hmm. in people. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so what we did there in this project is we asked patients to sit in a, it's actually in a church, where they were able to listen to the, to the musical pieces that Elaine was playing live. As Elaine was very specific, this had to be live music rather than recorded music and it for the gets maximum much, effect. Yeah, that's right. And um, we had, these were all patients who had biventricular pacemakers, they were set at a fixed heart rate, and they were all connected directly to their program, and so we could directly, um, immediately download the unipolar signals as they were listening to the music. This was already very ambitious, and uh, they were able to persuade eight patients to come and record with the help of the physiologists at Bart's Hospital and um, a number of the um, research fellows. The data that we've recorded is incredibly rich and actually does show some interesting insight. The advantage of using music is that it's very quantifiable. We are able to capture precisely what's happening in music at what time and relate that to the cardiac mm. signals and try to explain what exactly in the music is causing the response. Here, the cluster of low ARI values happens soon after a drastic change in loudness and tempo and also where the tension peaks. Computations and simulations by members of the Cosmos group have confirmed the importance of such structural changes for physiological changes. Uh, we're still in the process of analyzing this data. It's a very rich uh, set of data that has been collected. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, exciting because it's also done in, in a very uh, okay. ecological... Uh, a real, you mean a real world setting? A real world setting. Yeah. This is uh, people sitting in front of uh, an instrument yeah. in a live concert mm -hmm. and, and listening to it and feeling the sound waves mm -hmm. as it hits their body. And, and we're playing entire pieces, yeah. so entire sets of pieces. Mm -hmm. So um, it's just like you were if you were in a concert. Okay anyone probably listening to this discussion might think well this is all very nice and you've got a musician and an electrophysiologist <laughs> recording all sorts of funny signals from from patients hearts has this got any therapeutic value mm -hmm. and um, there's been quite a lot of work demonstrating that uh, different techniques using meditation for example and also music music itself can actually influence blood pressure and lower blood pressure so Elaine and I started thinking about whether we could actually use some of this knowledge of music on physiological signals to be of any value to treating patients or perhaps changing relevant cardiac uh, physiology. So what we wanted to do really was see whether we could design a, an app that would allow someone to listen to some music and then look at their own physiological response to see if we could increase their vagal tone with a view to perhaps um, lowering their blood pressure as a result of listening to the music as a, I suppose, a combination of an entertaining, relaxing, or interesting activity that also has beneficial effects for their cardiovascular health. Uh, this is the idea behind Heart FM. And Heart FM uh, is an app to, uh, that delivers music and at the same time captures the physiological signals to be analysed and uh, to be used in recommending further music in an intervention uh, to achieve certain physiological goals. We are using the physiological effects of the music, correlating that with the structure of the performance and trying to explain what it is that people are responding to and using that information to uh, influence uh, their physiology in future listening experiences. So really the, the idea is that we're creating a, effectively like a closed loop feedback where the, patient, where the listener, it's not necessarily a patient, their physiology is being changed by what they're listening to. They can then see the effect and potentially if we can demonstrate that this is an um, increase in their vagal tone, looking at the heart rate variability as a marker of this, then we can then tailor music for perhaps increasing vagal tone, reducing their um, likelihood of developing sympathetically driven arrhythmias, for example, or um, ideally lowering blood pressure, which is a more immediate um, benefit, which there is some evidence to support such interventions, such as listening to music, can be a benefit to individuals.